I put this video together mainly for newer traders who do not understand what they're seeing on a depth of market platform. I frequently get emails from people who tell me they want to learn more about order flow, but they brought up a depth of market, market depth, order book, it's all the same thing. And they looked at it and they see, you know, these columns you can see here on my homepage. And they don't understand what any of it is or what any of it means or how it can be beneficial. Uh, all they know is people talk about it and they hear about it, but they don't understand what any of it is. So this video has three separate parts. In part one, what I do is I show you exactly what you're seeing on a depth of market platform. I explain the difference between limit and market orders, the bids, the offers, uh, the prints that you're seeing on the inside column, uh, volume profile, and anyone who does not have a clear understanding of what they are seeing should be able to understand it once they get through part one. It takes a little bit of time, but I break it down and make it as simple as possible. I use some very simple diagrams to replicate what you would see uh, if you saw people at a market negotiating uh, on the price of a product. And I show how that crosses over to the depth of market platform. In part two of this video, I explain the benefits of the depth of market platform. I explain why it is that people who watch the order book have an advantage over people who do not watch the order book. And I do some comparisons between technical analysis trading and trading off uh, the depth of market. And again, once you watch this, it should become very clear as to why you want to watch a depth of market whenever you're trading. And in part three of the video, I briefly cover the mathematics involved in giving up the bid ask spread unnecessarily. And what I mean by that is sometimes it's very obvious that you can place a limit order, for example, on the, the bid and get the fill uh, instead of using a market order to pay up a tick and you save that tick by using a limit order instead of a market order. And I cover all of this in part three. Some people are already aware of it, but I've actually uh, talked to guys who have been trading for years, five, six years, that have never broken down the mathematics involved in that. And again, typically they're people that didn't spend a lot of time looking at the depth of market and they never had an idea of what kind of an impact just that small detail can have on your bottom line. So if you're an inexperienced trader who does not understand what it is you're seeing on the depth of market, then you will obviously want to start with part one and go through the entire video. It is a bit longer than I anticipated, but I tried to shorten it up more than it is now and it just didn't work. It needs every part for it to be understood properly. So you can watch it over the course of a few days. You know, you don't have to sit here for an hour and a half. If that's not your thing, you can watch 20 minutes a day for a few days in a row. Or maybe you're a person who doesn't mind sitting for an hour and a half. But if you don't understand, you do want to take the time to watch it. If you are an experienced trader who understands what it is that you're seeing on the depth of market, you still may want to watch part two and part three. I will mark in the description box uh, the time frame where you'll skip ahead to uh, to see those. And like I said, in part two, you may pick up some pointers with regards to how watching the order book is beneficial. And in part three, it just emphasizes the importance of understanding um, why you don't want to give up the bid-ask spread if you don't have to do so. Okay, let's get started with part one. So what exactly is it that you are seeing when you look at the order book? Um, also known as depth and sales, also known as market depth, also known as the ladder, right? Uh, it's called a ladder because you have bids going down, offers going up, and somewhere along the way when this thing was created, uh, somebody referred to it as a ladder and the name stuck. Actually, it's the order book. And what that means is it's um, that's going back to when specialists on the stock exchange had an order book and orders would come in and they would know how many shares were available on the buy side at what price and how many offers or how many shares were available um, for sale at certain prices. 
that was the order book and they would match these orders together okay that's where the term originally comes from as far as I'm aware so now of course it's electronic everybody can see it what you have is you have in the blue you have the bids these are limit buy orders in the red you have the offers which are limit sell orders and I'm going to go through exactly what that means for anybody who's not quite sure these inside columns you have current trades at either the buy or or the sell side so um, I'm going to like I said, I'm going to go through all this and show you as it as it plays out this is where if I place an order you'll see the order show up as the order column this is the price uh, this is the volume profile we'll get into that later uh, we're looking at the E-mini S&P 500, the September 2016 contract. Uh, this is a workspace I created specifically just for this video. Behind it, you'll see a two-minute chart of the S&P, E-mini S&P. Um, I use two minutes because I know that's a popular time frame for most day traders who are chart traders. And then up here, we have my order box. You can see that it is in SIM mode. That's because I'm doing a video, obviously, and showing samples. Um, we have it set to a one lot. And you'll see that when I execute sample trades, you'll see that I'm placing the orders over here. And then when I get filled, you'll see that it shows that I'm either long, short, or flat over here in this order box. Okay. And like I mentioned before, this is the jigsaw depth in sales. There are other... Uh, market depth tools out there most platforms have them some are better than others for intraday scalping I personally uh, feel Jigsaw is the best you know it's a plug for Jigsaw um, I do like them uh, I like the company I like the platform and that's what I use okay um, but what I'm going to explain is what you're going to see on other platforms as well Jigsaw just has a few more bells and whistles than most of them so I've created some images here and they're very basic images uh, but they're meant to mimic what you will see on the depth and sales and I think that by breaking it down as much as I am uh, pretty much anybody can understand how this whole thing works okay and so like I said this is the very basic part of the video but a lot of people in the world don't understand what they're seeing on the order book they, and they like I said, they come to me and they need more information and more explanations about what they're seeing. So I've created some images to sort of help this. The images um, are a little funny because I've created some stick men here to help with this process. But I think by the time the video is over, uh, anybody who watches this will clearly understand what they're seeing in the order book. So right now, if you look at the order book in the S&P, you will see that there are 747 contracts available uh, at 2158. These are limit buy orders. You will see there are 667 uh, contracts available uh, for sale at 2158.25. Okay, these are limit sell orders. Now, this number is a combination of different orders, and it's important to understand this as you go along. This could be one trader working an order of 747 contracts. It could be one guy working one or 747 one lots. Um, it could be 100 traders working seven lots, right? So it's 700 and then one guy working a 47 lot. So the number that you see here is a combination of all the different orders out there. So maybe I place a one lot somebody else places a one lot, somebody else places a 10 lot. So this is the aggregate number um, that's available on the buy side, obviously vice versa on the sell side. Okay, so to compare that to our our stick figure chart here, let's say that we have some guys and they're in the Apple market. I know it sounds kind of, kind of silly, not Apple computer, but apples is in the apples that you eat, okay? An actual commodity. And the Apple market is busy and right now <clears throat> what you see is that there are three guys who are willing to buy apples at five dollars and there are three guys who are willing to sell an apple we'll say at six dollars now if all of these people just stand here 
and nobody is willing to compromise on price. If all three of these guys stand here all day long for eight hours and they don't want to, you know, sell at five. And if all three of these guys stand here for eight hours and they don't want to buy at six, absolutely nothing will happen. There will be no transactions. There will be no trades. Nobody will buy and sell and the price will not move. Okay. So that's the first point to understand. Limit buys, limit sells. If no one is willing to go up or down here, nothing's going to happen. The only way price moves is if somebody is willing to pay higher or sell, you know, sell lower uh, in order to, to take the trade. So price only moves when eventually someone's willing to pay up or pay down and they do that through what we call market orders. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Here's what I mean by that. Let's say that this guy who's first in line, he's been standing here for 30 minutes trying to buy an apple for $5. And no one is willing to sell him an apple for $5. The best price that he sees is $6. Finally, he gives up and he says, you know what? Fine, I will pay $6 for an apple. And so he goes to this guy and the two of them agree on a price of six dollars so he buys an apple for six dollars he sells him that apple for six dollars when that happens you will see the trade transact right here okay so what that means is this guy went to this guy bought an apple and there's your one apple that's traded at six dollars obviously that would translate to one contract in the futures that's what shows in these inside columns on jigsaw so now why is that important it's important because it's showing me that people were sitting here at these prices and eventually somebody finally decided to pay six dollars rather than wait to get paid at five now what happens now is those guys are gone out of the equation right and in the markets he would be long at six dollars and the other guy who was just here would be short at six dollars right now we have two guys still willing to sell at six two guys still willing to buy at five and let's say these guys stand here a little bit longer another 20 30 minutes goes by eventually this guy gets tired of waiting to sell at six dollars and he says you know what fine I will sell an apple at five dollars so he goes to this guy and he says you're willing to you know buy an apple for five dollars and the guy goes yeah he goes fine sold and the two of them do a transaction and when they do their transaction it shows up as a trade in this column so this is showing that he was willing to go down and pay five dollars or excuse me sell his apple for five dollars and then he bought at five dollars so we saw one transaction take place at six and then we saw another transaction take place at five and when that happens those two guys are now gone right now this guy is long at five dollars this guy is short at five dollars whereas the first guy is short at six dollars and the first guy is long at six dollars because they agreed upon their transaction at six and the first guy who bought at six dollars if he's still standing around he's pretty annoyed because he realizes if he had stood there for another 20 or 30 minutes he would have been able to buy that apple for five dollars instead of six dollars so this is how it works going back and forth in this situation now let's compare this to what we would see on a depth of market what you can see is I've cleared you can see it up here it, it captured the uh, little box says clear current trades so what's happened is that I've cleared all the trades in the center box you can do this at any time when you have your your depth and sales open and what you're going to see is there's going to be a trade that transacts right here at 2158.25 now you'll see there's 667 on the offer right right there a five lot trades so what this means is that five contracts transacted at 2158.25 so there's limit buy orders there those still register as 747 because they haven't traded yet 
this 667 is now down at 660. Now it, it was at 667. So what that means is that the five lot traded, five of those contracts for sale traded, and then somebody canceled an order for a two lot, right? So let me back this up so you understand. Okay, so there's 667 on the offer, and I believe it actually goes to 668 here. And then what you'll see is five trades, and then the amount dropped to 660. Right there. So that went 668, a five lot trades. That would take it from 668 to 663, right? 668 minus 5, 663. And then actually three contracts get canceled. So it drops to 660. So you didn't have eight contracts trade to take it to 660. You only had five, and then three contracts were canceled. And this happens all day long, and that's why you see the numbers changing back and forth. So there may be, for example, 1339 bid at 2157.75, but actually when the market goes down towards that price, you may see <clears throat> that 339 contracts drop away, and the bid goes to 1,000, and nothing actually traded there. So those are limit buy orders that get canceled at that moment, and that's why you see the bids and offers changing all day long, because people are consistently adding uh, and canceling orders to both sides, all right? Um, so that's why you see it change when nothing happens. So you see the, the, the uh, transaction go off a five lot trades. And so going back to that first trade on a little chart, that's what happened here. We had these two guys that were up front. They did a transaction. This guy's long at six. This guy's short at six. And now they're out of the order book. And now the action continues. Okay, so right there you see a one lot trades down in the 2158. So that means that somebody, as, as well as a one lot trades up in 2158.25. So it goes from five to six. So this is an aggregate number. It will accumulate, right? So you don't make any mistakes. That's not a five lot and then a six lot. Five contracts traded, then one more contract traded and made that five lot into six right there. Um, or made the number five to six. And that's your total amount that's trading at this point in time. So this one lot that trades down at 2158 even is the equivalent of this over here. When finally this guy says, fine, you know what? I'll sell you the apple at $5. He says, fine, I'll buy it at $5. And then their transaction shows up right here. And then those two guys are gone, right? And then we have one guy left uh, in each scenario. Now, what will eventually happen here, let's say, this guy, and you see that went from a one to a two. This guy stands there for 30 minutes. He sees, okay, this one guy is not going to budge at $6. If I want to buy an apple, I'm going to have to pay up to $6. So these two come together and they agree on a transaction. And that's why you'll see this one go to two because now we've seen two apples trade at $6 you know, i.e. two contracts trade at $6 and one contract traded at $5. Over here, we've seen six contracts trade at 2158.25 and one contract trade at 2158 even. So that's what's actually happening in these inside columns here. And price will eventually move when there's nothing left on one side and then buyers or sellers decide to raise their bid or lower their offer. Okay, so this guy and this guy do a trade. It trades right here. We see uh, the cumulative go from one to two. It shows you two contracts have traded at $6 or two apples have traded at $6. And then what's gonna happen is this guy's gonna leave. He's now short. This guy decides that he doesn't need just one apple, he actually needs another apple. The problem is that there are no more offers left at $6. The only apples available are up here at $7. And you can see that you have four different people up here who are willing to sell at seven in the same way you have three willing to buy at four down here. Um, and then you have one guy, let's say at three and two guys at eight. Uh, so obviously this equates with 
the bids below and the offers above on your depth of market. So now this guy says, well, I'm clearly not going to be able to buy at this moment at five dollars. So let me raise my bid to six. I just bought an apple at six. Let me see if I can get another one here. Let me see if this guy right here might be willing to come down to six dollars. So he now raises his bid to six dollars and he's bidding at six waiting to see if he can get filled there. When that happens, what we say in the industry is that uh, sixes just went bid. Okay, so what does that mean? It means that you had offers at six, you had bids at five. I'll back it up even more. You had an offer at six, a bid at five. Um, so the market is currently five bid at six. It means your limit bids are at five, your limit offers are at six. Okay, you'll hear me use the term they hit. Um, meaning a buyer hits an offer or a seller hits a buyer. So in this situation, the buyer hits the seller's offer at six, and that's why the transaction takes place there. When that happens, your seller is filled, he's out. Now, when the buyer decides to move his bid up from five to six, now we are six bid at seven. Okay, so sixes go bid. If it went the other way, obviously, and someone came from six to five, then we would say that fives went offer. They went offer at five, meaning sellers moved their offer down from six to five. Okay, and by the way, when you see the market go up or down here on the inside, that's where you, where you get the term uptick, downtick. You know, it's an uptick. Obviously, if it goes um, from a price up to the next price, it's a downtick. If it goes from the last price, uh, down a price. Okay, so this buyer transacts at six. He now raises his bid to six in an effort to try and buy from one of these guys who's offering at seven. Now, going back to our depth of market, what we're going to see is we're going to see the market go down uh, briefly a tick before going back up. So it's going to be the opposite of what we're seeing on our little diagrams. Um, but You'll get the point. So you can see that there's 753 here on the bid still available. And the market's going to trade a little bit. Right there, you see six more contracts straight, or excuse me, five more contracts straight, right? It goes from a one lot up to a six. And then what's going to happen is sellers are going to agree to sell at 21.58 even. And they're going to hit all of the bid limit bid orders that are sitting here and then the market's going to go offer at 2158 right there you see that so what happened there is the sellers who were sitting at 2158 25 maybe some of them or just sellers sitting on the sidelines you you know it, it can be a combination finally decide hey you know what I'm not going to try to get filled at 2158.25. I'm willing to sell at 2158. And so they hit all of these orders at 2158. And you'll see 734 traded into the bid as sellers used market sell orders to hit a limit buy order. Okay. And that's what shows up in this column right here. Now, as soon as they did that, you, you can see that sell orders also began building up and offering out at 2158. So in other words, they moved their offers or the offers went down a tick to 2158, the same way that this guy moved his bid from five to six. Some offers moved from 5825 to 58 even. When that happened, a few buyers step back in, 69 to be exact, um, or not 69 buyers, but 69 contracts traded after the 734. And the reason they show in blue is because the market was already limit offer at that point. So it ticks down, contracts begin building up, and of course this happens in the blink of an eye, um, but sometimes it's fast, sometimes not that fast. And then some buyers come back in and say, you know what, I'll buy 69 more contracts at 58. 
and that's what we see here. We also see that a few sellers now basically get a little concerned, most likely is what happens here, and sell 24 contracts into 5775. So there was a limit bid sitting here, the market goes offer at 58 even, and then some sell orders are triggered, and they trigger off at 57.75, right? So at this moment in time, what we've seen is uh, just over 800 contracts trade at 58. Six have traded at 58.25, and 24 have traded at 57.75. So hopefully this is all coming together and, and making more sense for you. So I'm going to fast forward a little bit here on the price action uh, on the depth of market uh, because it does begin ticking up and that I'll just keep it going the same direction as my diagrams go and um, try to keep it as simple as possible here. What you'll see is it trades a bit and you see a few contracts are trading down, a few are trading up. You see them build as they trade, two lots, three lots, five lots, and they get added to the total amount, right? And then what happens is they end up buying back through now at 58. So the contracts that were offer at 58 all get bought. That's why you see it transact here. It goes bid, and then a few sell orders hit back into this. goes back offer again, goes back bid again, trade some contracts there, quite a few contracts at 58. And then right there finally, go back it up, you're going to see that buyers are going to hit into 58.25 and this offer is going to disappear and they're going to go bid at 58.25. And so you see over 600 traded, you're going to see that in blue because it means buyers or attacking sell orders um, or hitting into sell orders at 25. And then you see this quick print of 373 in red. And what that means is as soon as this was lifted, 373 contracts go bid at 58.25, right? The same way we have one guy move up to six from five to six we have orders come in at 58.25 and sellers, more sellers, are willing to sell another 373 contracts back into that bid. Now the bid is still building and it's still a bid at 58.25 so that means if you still want to sell at 58.25 you can still sell 316 contracts there. There's still a bid. But that's why you see action, or excuse me, prints in both blue and red. It's showing buyers hitting the offer and then sellers hitting the new bid. Okay. So now going back to our diagram, we have the one guy who bought at six, he decided he needed another apple, so he now moves his bid up to six, hoping that somebody offering at seven will do a transaction with him at six. When this happens, these three guys down here all realize that they're definitely not going to be able to buy at four, and now it doesn't even look like they're going to be able to buy at five price is moving up and they all want to be in on the action and of course this is the whole idea behind speculation of the market you know speculation in the markets is they're not in it because they want to buy apples they're in it because they want to turn a profit and so they're trying to figure out well now maybe we should come up here and if we can buy apples at six dollars maybe we can sell them for seven or eight dollars all right so what happens is they all jump up and join the bid. So you have your one guy here and he's sitting there and he's the only guy bidding at six. All of a sudden these three guys jump up and join him. So now you have four guys bidding at six dollars and four guys offering at seven dollars. So going back to our depth of market, that's what you see taking place when the market upticks. Um, if we re rewind just a little bit here, you'll see that they buy at 25 right there and what happens is as buyers begin buying at 25 and bidding at 25 that 
uh, causes other speculators to want to come in and buy at 25 as well because they don't want to miss out on a tick up to 50 or to 58.75. And so that's what we see in our diagram. We have a buyer buys what's left at six. He moves his bid up, and now these guys all decide to move their bid up as well and join him on the buy side. All right, and that's what you see happening right here. They buy it. More buy orders come in at 25. They don't want to miss out on the move. Okay, so things look a little bit interesting now because buyers are moving up their their bids, and the sellers are not hitting back into the bid at six. None of these guys is willing to pay down and sell at six. All of them are standing their ground and just leaving their limit sell orders out. And since none of these guys want to pay eight or nine or miss out on a potential uh, profit opportunity, all of them decide to buy at seven. And when that happens, you see four print right here. And it, it prints right here because these four guys all decided to do a transaction at seven with these four guys. And so it's once again buyers <clears throat> hitting into limit sell orders. So you're, they're using buy market orders to hit into a limit sell order. So now they're all long at $7 and these four guys are short at $7. So then when this transaction takes place, the sellers at seven are now gone. And here's where it becomes interesting particularly when you have people that are making very short-term plays or doing short-term speculation, which is what most people are doing these days, most programs. That's why they're called HFT. They're high-frequency trading, very short-term type trades. All of these guys buy at 7, and immediately they turn around and offer at 8 because they're looking for a short-term profit. They buy at seven, they turn around, they want to sell at eight, and they want to capture that one dollar of profit. There's a problem with that though. Now, only one person is bidding at seven dollars. Some straggler over here, I say straggler, some guy over here who's missed it at five, he's missed it at six, he doesn't want to miss out and he goes, you know what, okay, I'll buy at 7 too. And he puts his bid out here. But there's a problem. There's only one guy on the bid and there are six guys on the offer. Well, clearly if this guy sees that there are six people willing to sell at $8 and he's the only guy willing to buy at 7 most likely he'll be able to buy at 7 One of these guys will eventually say, you know what, we're not going to get filled at 8 or I'm not going to get filled at 8 I'll go ahead and pay down and sell at seven dollars and when that happens you see this right here okay market goes back down one trades between this guy and this guy <clears throat> and then what will happen is the trades on the way up will eventually they, they clear out uh, and there are certain parameters you can set we won't get into that today but this side will clear out and you'll see the market begins to hit back down into the bid so if we go back to our order book workspace we'll see a similar thing here the bid will follow up. It'll trade a little bit back and forth. And then, you know, right there we see that no one's really willing to pay up to 58.50 yet. The offers are sitting there. They're changing around, but only an eight lot trades at 58.50. And then some more contracts hit back into 58.25. few more trade at 58.50 and then boom drops back down to offer at 58.25 right as sellers now begin hitting back into the bid like we see over here a seller finally hit back into the bid and then that shows up in this column so once this trade takes place here at seven you now have this guy is long at seven and he stands aside and he's hoping that the market will go to eight, nine, and ten. The guy who's selling at seven might be getting short. Maybe he thinks this is a short lived up move and he thinks the market's going to go back to six or five. Or it is also possible that maybe he's a guy who bought earlier in the day at three or four or five, let's say. And now the market's trading up and he sees there's also a lot of sellers at eight. He's not sure if he's going to get his price at eight. So he decides to go ahead and pocket his profit at seven. 
it could be a trade being initiated, could be a trade being closed. But the important thing to notice is that you know a guy is selling back down into the bid. And what happens here is that this now changes the dynamic somewhat because now there are no more bids at seven. You only have two guys bidding at six now, and you have five guys offering it at eight, okay? And four of those guys are guys who bought at seven looking for a profit. So they buy at seven hoping to make a profit at eight, and now none of them are able to get filled at eight, and this concerns them. And so there are no bids at seven. There are only bids at six. Well, they don't want to lose money, so what they do is they all drop lower and now move their offer to seven and they're trying to scratch their trade at break even now okay that's what they're hoping they're hoping that at least these two guys will pay up and and hit seven and then the two guys in front can at least break even uh, on the trade that they made at seven when they got long at seven tried to sell at eight they can't sell at eight now they're trying to, to scratch the trade or break even at seven this is how momentum can shift in the markets and this is why it's so important to understand what you're seeing in the order book and why you should be watching it. Price moves due to supply and demand. It's that simple. It's a basic fundamental understanding of economics. And what we're seeing at first, what we were seeing is there was a bit more demand than supply. Buyers were willing to pay up, supply disappeared. Buyers were willing to pay up, supply disappeared. And then suddenly what you see is you have a lot more supply than you have demand. And as a result of that, the people with the supply offering to sell now begin lowering their price in an attempt to dump their product. Okay, so what we have now is we have five guys who are willing to try to sell at seven and two guys who are willing to buy at six. And so eventually what happens is these two guys decide, you know what, I've got to get out. This is, seems to be turning around. And they do trades with these two guys. And that shows up right here. Two contracts trade, two apples trade, right, between these two guys and these two guys. And that transaction takes place at $6, okay? And so these guys who were long – um are now getting out at six and then those two disappear right those two drop off those two drop off now we have a big discrepancy because at the moment all we see are three offers at seven and one buy at three with not much in between either way and your last transaction were these two contracts that took place at six so imagine that you've bought at seven looking for the market to go up you turn around you offer out at eight trying to make a one dollar profit very quickly and then you try to drop down to seven just to break even you're like fine I'll get out of seven I'll break even I'll get my money back and suddenly there are no bids in sight well that's going to make you anxious to begin lowering your offer because if you can only lose one dollar at six it's better than having to pay all the way down to three dollars you know, in which case you would lose $4 on that trade. And so we do see one guy pop up here at $4, and you still only have one guy at 3 but there's still a discrepancy here because there's no bids at 5 or 6 So what happens now? These three guys are all trying to get out of their trades, and what they're going to do is they're going to lower their offer from 7 to five. They're going to skip right over six. They're going to drop down to five and see if maybe they can't uh, sell at that price. So they all jump down. Now, when that happens, what you also see in, in Jigsaw is you that's where you see the inside prints clear out again and they reset. So if a trade prints, it'll be a new transaction now where we see at five um, or we'll see one at four. All right. And so what happens now is you got three guys here, one guy here. Finally, this guy says, you know what? I'm out. I'm done. I'm over it. I will sell at four. And so he does a transaction with this guy who's buying at four. Those two guys are gone. No bid at four. All you have is this one guy willing to buy at three, right? 
So now they move down. Fine. We'll sell at four. We'll sell at four. Will you buy from four? And the guy just sits there and stares at him. He goes, no, not really. Don't want to buy at four. I'll buy at three. Eventually, this guy says, fine. I can't handle it anymore. I'm, I'm stuck. I got suckered in. I bought at seven. I couldn't get eight. Then I couldn't get seven. Then I couldn't get fives. I can't even get fours. I'm not going to sell at two or one. So he did the transaction at $3. And then he's gone, he's out. Now, this guy is a little more stubborn, and he says, you know what, I refuse. I'll watch this thing go to zero before I sell at three. You know, I'm only going to sell at four. And this guy, who's pretty sure he's getting a bargain at this point, because the market was just trading six and seven earlier, and will probably go back up to at least five or six later in the day, in his mind. He says, you know what, I'll buy, have one at three. I'll buy one at four, too. And so now he does a transaction with this guy. And so he's now long one contract at three and long another contract at four. And this again, this is where how you see these transactions take place uh, in the inside columns. This guy is now gone. He's out. He took his $3 loss. And this guy's long and he's going to sit there and wait and see what happens. And so eventually what happens is more people come back into the game. And you see that two more buyers come in who are willing to buy at three, plus this guy who's still willing to buy at three if anybody wants to sell there. You have two new guys come in. They're willing to buy at four now. Uh, you know, they saw this trade take place. They think, eh, maybe I can buy at four, sell at five. And then you have two guys here willing to sell at five, three guys willing to sell at six. And the market basically goes back into a state of equilibrium where not much is happening. Um, no one really wants to pay up or down, and everybody is just going to sit there again until market orders on one side or the other begin driving the market up or down, right? And that's how it all works. So we get the movement because there is an influx of orders. We have people who are ready to trade. They want to play. It starts at, you know, bid five, offer six. Then buyers come in to take out sixes and they take out sevens, but then nobody wants eights. So then sellers begin hitting sevens and sixes and they're dropping their offers and it comes down and then finally you know a couple guys buy at three and four and then some of the guys who were long at five and six may have sold seven and profited the guys who went long at seven all got burnt as the market pulled in and they lost money and then new money comes back in and the market basically just stays sideways until you see another wave where uh, demand outstrips supply. In addition to the bids and asks and inside prints, there is also another column which has the cumulative volume profile. So what this is is simply the total amount of contracts which have traded at this price uh, over the course of the day. And you can adjust that so that it captures the overnight amount which trades or you can reset it so it only starts for example at 9 30 a.m when equities come online uh, and the, the uh, stock exchange is open officially so you can change up the hours which are covered but it is the total amount which trades so for example you see it, it reads 27,412 at 2158.25 a five lot prints and you see it goes from 27,412 to 27,417 reflecting the fact that five more contracts traded at this price. Now this can be extremely useful at certain times because it clearly shows you where there are large volume areas versus low volume areas. For example right now we can see that the market has been ranging here between 58.75, where there's 33,000, down to 57.25, 56.25. You have 22,000, 19, 24,000, right? So, with the exception of this 19, everything is above 20,000 in this area. We're above 30,000, um, 33,000 here, 26, 27. So, these types of areas that build up often act as consolidation areas or areas of support or resistance. For example, if the market moved up a bit and then came back down into this area, 
frequently the market will pause and bounce a little bit because everybody sees it's an area of high volume or vice versa if it goes down and comes back up. And so you can see clearly that there's more interest in activity from both the buy and the sell side between 58.75 and 56.75 than there was at 59 and above here. You see there's a lot less volume and you can see how the market fell through that pretty easily on this down move on the chart here. You see it from about 61.50 all the way down to 57. Uh, and you can see how there's lower volume in this area and then higher volume again in this area, which is where it ends up finding some temporary support. Now, sometimes this information is useful, sometimes not. It depends on the scenario, but you definitely do want to have this up throughout the day. It can be really helpful during certain time periods and in certain types of price action. This is different than market profile, so don't confuse the two. Uh, you may have never heard of market profile, and if you haven't, that's okay. But a lot of people use traditional market profile charts, and those are volume-based, but they're also connected to the amount of time which passes with the volume. So they are two different things. This is simply the overall volume at each price throughout the course of this one particular day, whereas market profile charts will often go back three, four, five days or longer and the high volume, low volume areas will be separated based on a, uh, an amount of time which someone programs in as their uh, parameter, whatever it is they want to use. Jigsaw also has a few more columns which you can add in. That goes beyond the scope of this video here. If you do understand everything you see here and you decide to check out the platform and start using the order book, then obviously you can go to the Jigsaw site and go through the videos there in the manual and see all the other features which are available. All right, so quickly I'm just going to show you how you place orders uh, on the platform. Um, again, just so you understand the basics of it. Uh, let's say I want to sell at 2158.75, but I don't want to sell at 2158.50. What I would do is I put my cursor over 2158.75 and whenever I click you see right there you can see it turns into a little hand I place an order right there so what does this show me it shows that I have placed a sell limit order uh, for a one contract at 2158.75 and this is your estimated position in the queue which means I'm basically last so you see there were 356 there I placed my one lot I'm at 357 um, right now I'm last in line <clears throat> and what that means is all these contracts have to trade or some of them have to be canceled and then the rest have to trade in order for me to get filled but the only way that I'm going to get filled on this order is if buyers use buy market orders to hit these limit sell orders. So I'm going to have to see trades take place here in order for me to get filled. We can let this play out. You see the order still working. Not a lot happening at this moment. and then there it trades. So as soon as it trades you see that the order disappears from the order column the price goes red to indicate that I'm short and you'll see there's a little negative one in my order box up here and that means I'm now short one contract uh, at 2158.75 alright so in this scenario what I did just to show again using a limit order is I'm going to end up placing a, a buy limit order at 2158.50 right there you see now I've placed a buy limit order um, again I'm obviously last in the queue or last in line since I was joining after everybody else who's put orders there and in order for me to get this fill sellers 
were will have to hit this bid. They'll have to agree not to sell at 21.58.75, but they'll have to agree to sell at 21.58.50, and we'll see those sell orders execute right here. And when they do, you will see that I get the fill right there. Okay, so sellers hit all the buy orders. It goes offer at 21.58.50. You see this goes to zero. You see I'm no longer red. That means I've exited the trade and I successfully scalped one tick on the simulator. Okay, obviously this is for illustration purposes just to show you how to um, execute trades. Now let's say I think price is going to move up and I want to be long, but I don't think I will get filled at 21.58.25. So in other words, if I place a limit buy order right here, I don't think sell orders are going to hit into the buy orders. I don't think it's going to trade in red. I think the only way I'm going to be able to get this trade is if I use a market order and hit the limit sell orders that are sitting right here. So what I will do is I'll come over, I'll put the hand, you know, this cursor right over the buy side, the blue here, and when I click it means that I'm hitting into these sell orders and I should be filled instantaneously. And right there you see that I am. As soon as I, you don't even see the order register right here, I click and immediately I'm long 21.58.50. You see a plus one in blue in the order box. Um, and that means I've used a market order to buy into the limit sell orders right here. And so now let's say, hey, you know what? I think I just made a mistake. Here I am buying 21.58.50s and now sellers are selling 21.58.25. Uh, I don't like to trade anymore. I want to be out. Ideally, of course, I would offer out at 58.50 and I would be able to scratch the trade for a break even. However, because I can see that sellers are hitting the bid, I know that I may not be able to get a limit sell order at 58.50 and I don't want to sell at 58 evens and lose two ticks. So I go ahead and use another market order to sell. I place my cursor right here in the red. When I click it, I'm going to be hitting these bids with a market sell order, I'm going to hit the limit buy order and I'll instantly be out of my trade. Right there. You see I click, it briefly flashes red, I'm now flat at zero in the order box and you you, know, you see that I'm not red over here on the price and that means I'm flat. Okay, so that's how you use the market and limit orders uh, on your depth of market platform. Jigsaw also has a nice little feature within this order placement uh, capabilities. It's called auto. And what that means is that if you place a buy order at the, right at the bid, um, it'll obviously be a limit bid order. If you place it uh, the next block up, you know, next price up, and you hit the offer, you'll immediately get a fill and you'll be long at 58.75. However, if you go past the inside market, it doesn't turn into a market buy order, it's a stop limit order. Um, why this is handy is because you can place an order, for example, and so let's say right here I'm filled, right, I'm long 5850s, and now I want to put an emergency stop in a hard stop. So in other words, if something goes wrong, if my computer goes down, connection goes down, I have worst case scenario, uh, an emergency sell order um, in place that will prevent me from getting hammered for 15 or 20 ticks. So without changing anything at all within the order box, I can just bring my cursor down, click, and now I have a sell stop order at 57 even. So worst case scenario, the market was to move down to that price and I didn't hit out before then, or like I said, I lost my connection um, and now the market's moving against my favor and I can't log on and I'm trying to get on the phone to get out of the position, you know, but the market gets here first, that'll trigger off a stop market order and I will, um, <clears throat> as soon as it trades at 57, it'll become a market sell order and it'll get me out of the trade. Um, the beauty of that though is I don't have to change anything within the order box, right? So that order can sit there and then if I go up 
and you'll see that I go to hit out at market, it will cancel, order cancels order, this uh, emergency stop. So right there you saw, I clicked on the red here, it was a market order, it immediately exits my position and then it cancels my emergency stop order and it's all one click trading. So it's just another little added benefit of Jigsaw. Now I'm going to explain to you why it's important that you watch the order book if you're a day trader. The order book contains the orders, right? It contains buy side orders, sell side orders, uh, and it shows transactions. It is showing you supply and demand like I discussed earlier in this video. Anytime demand outweighs supply, the market is going to move in that direction. So if there's a lot of buy side demand and not very much uh, for offer on the sell side, then price is going to move up. If there's a lot of selling demand but not much available on the buy side, price is going to move down. That's just the way it works. Every chart and every indicator is based on what happens in the order book. That's all there is to it. So it's all extrapolated from this. A lot of people don't see the advantage of it because they don't understand what I explained uh, in the, the first part of this video. They don't even understand what they're seeing on the depth of market. Some other people understand what they're seeing, but they don't see the benefit in it. They think that it's not that useful, that there can't be any information gain from watching the order book that they can't see by just watching price on a chart. Um, and in fact, you know, I've read several posts from people who claim that order book strategies are just one more fad in the newest, you know, world of electronic trading. They're not helpful and no one really needs to pay attention to them. And, you know, people make comments like that. The people that do, A, they've never worked in a firm, obviously. Because if they had, they would know that they're incorrect. B, traders have been watching the order flow since the inception of the markets, right? I mean, before there were ever charts or indicators, you had a bunch of guys standing at a market and they're watching what's going on. Who's buying? Who's selling? How much is he buying? How much is he selling? And based on that, do I think the market, or excuse me, do I think the price is going to go up or down? So... I'm just going to show you a couple of examples of ways that this is useful. Now the most obvious example would be in a situation where clearly there's more sell side pressure um, than buy side pressure. So there's more demand in other words for going short than there is for going long or for buying. The first place that you would notice that would be in the actual depth itself. So, for example, let's use this diagram to explain a potential setup. Let's say that the market has been moving down. And let's say that 5 is a technical support area. Okay, the market stopped at 5 yesterday or the day before or whatever. And now people are looking at this as a technical uh, potential buy side trade. If you're just looking at a chart, all you see is that price is approaching 5. It's trading 7s and it's trading 6. Now it's trading 5. Um, what do I do? If you're looking at an order book, what you may see is that the market went through the bids at 7 very easily. So sellers hit 400 trades down. Only 100 comes back in at 7. Then sellers take out everything at six. 500 trade at six from sellers using market orders to attack the bid. And then when it goes offer, you only have 50 contracts trade as buy market orders back into the offer. And now what you see is you have 950 contracts offered at six and you only have 400 bid at five. If you go back to our earlier diagrams of where I was showing people on the bid and offer, it equates to one of those situations. I'll bring it up for you. Now it's obviously not quite this exaggerated, but it's a situation where you have a lot more sellers showing their hand at eight and only one guy buying at seven, right? So here we have more people offering out at six than we have 
willing to buy at five. And in addition to that, <clears throat> you're already seeing sellers trade down into the bid. So sellers are using market orders to hit the limit buy orders in the same way that this guy ends up finally hitting this guy's bid at seven. So to show you that, right, one trades at seven, and then there's nobody there. So now all these sellers still want to sell. They have to lower their offer down to seven, okay? And so that's what's been happening here. Sellers hit sevens. Eventually, there's no more limit buy orders. They now have to lower their offer to seven. Then they take out everything at six. There's no more limit buy order to six. Now they have to lower their offer to six. And now you're seeing there's more offers at six than there are bids at five. And already sellers are beginning to attack the bids at five. Now in this scenario, even though this might be a technical support area at five, a person watching the order book can clearly see sellers have control. They're hitting bid, they're going offer. They're hitting the bid, they're going offer. They're already hitting the bid. There would be no reason to step in front of that pressure as a buyer right here. It doesn't make any sense when you can clearly see that there is more sell side depth than there is buy side depth. And when you can see that sellers are aggressively using market orders to hit in the bids and then offer out lower. If a person is contemplating a buy order right here and he can see this happening, a guy watching the order book would say, you know what, maybe I don't want to buy five right here. And then in that scenario, what could possibly happen? And of course, I mean, it varies depending on moment to moment and day to day. But <clears throat> what might happen is you see that the sellers take out fives and fours, which would make sense, right? So notice you'll have 400 left on the bid here, 350 on the bid here at four. And what happens is sellers end up selling everything else here, this 400, which will make this be 500. And then sellers will go for the bid at four. There's 350 here, then you'll see 350 here, like so. And so they sell, they offer out, and then 350 more trade here at four, and they offer out, okay? And as long as sellers are hammering the bids and offering lower, there would be no reason to step up and place a buy order there. Now, if you're trading strictly off of a chart or you're looking at the technicals, and you just randomly, not randomly, but you have a limit buy order working at five because, hey, I'm looking for support to hold. You're completely missing out on the information in the order book, which is cluing you into the fact that the market is probably going to go through five. It may not go from five to one, but it's probably going to go from five to four or five to three. And so the chart trader who has a bid here gets filled as the market blasts right through him, you know, just because he has a limit bid and he's working the technical, whereas an order book trader who was thinking about a buy may now not buy there and save himself from entering at, at a time when the market is continuing to move down. And in fact, he may completely change his mind. He may originally have thought he was going to buy at five, but when he begins to see the sell pressure build up and sellers hit the bids, he now turns around and actually sells at five, looking for the market to break lower because he sees the pressure in the, in the ladder. The order book trader has an advantage because he's watching supply and demand. I mean, it really is that simple. Now, let's look at this a different way. Let's say when the market goes from eight to seven to six, instead of looking like this, where we clearly have a lot of sell side depth, and sell side pressure and not so much on the buy side, we see a market that looks like this, where we have more on the buy side depth than we have on the sell side depth. And in addition to that, what we're noticing is that even though it is trading towards five, we're noticing that a lot is trading on both the red side and the blue side here in our inside columns. So yes, they traded 800 at market orders into the bid at seven, but then there were 600 more that traded into the offer at seven. And then they traded down here at six, 600 traded as sellers hit the bid, but even though the sellers are offering out at six, you have a lot of buyers coming back in willing to buy at six. 
So you've had 700 contracts trade back into the offer here at six in this scenario, whereas in this scenario, you've only had 50 trade back into the offer at six, right? So clearly in this situation, there's a lot more interest in buying at six and seven than there is in this situation, right? So now by watching the order book, you can see that. Whereas once again, someone just watching price on the chart only sees trading six, trading five, trading six, trading seven, trading six, trading five. They're not seeing how it's trading. Also in this scenario, you can see that no one has even printed a one lot into five, okay? So clearly there's a lot more buying interest at six and seven in this scenario. The selling depth, or excuse me, the amount of, of offers, um, amount of depth on the sell side is less than the amount of depth on the buy side. And so far, no one's even wanted to trade a one lot into five. So in a such situation like this, now maybe you do have an order flow trader who was thinking about buying five because it was a, te uh, because it was a technical support area along with watching the order flow and he realizes hey you know this might actually be a good buy i can see that they are currently holding i can see there is buying interest at six and in fact i can't even get filled at five because no one is trading into five so maybe i'll go ahead and buy six here looking for the market to go seven eight nine is it always that crystal clear no of course not but these situations do arise and this is where looking at the order book can sometimes be helpful to kind of bring that concept over to the actual uh, market depth platform. Now we're obviously not going to see a run through lows or highs here. We're not going to see fast momentum, but I do want to show you something and it's just a good example of how you can see a little bit of momentum for a tick or two, um, how it plays out in the order book at times. Notice that there's 295 on the bid and there's only, excuse me, there's 908 uh, on the offer. And this is where I had did a, a sample trade at 21.58.50, right? And I'm long and I'm about to hit into this and mark it out and get out of the trade. But what you're going to notice is that this 908 ends up dropping away without any contracts trading. And what that means is contracts are pulling. So you see it goes from 900 to 805, you see that? So it drops from 908 to 541. Nothing's traded there, so it's not as though 360 contracts have traded. It's just orders that were there that have now been canceled. And so now your depth is changing. The sell side depth is reducing, and the buy side depth is actually increasing a little bit. It's gone from 200 and something to 352. And now 44 do trade, but more than that goes away because 44 contracts trade, it dropped from 540 to 366, okay? So 100 and some contracts get canceled again. So now we've seen this depth go from 900 to 366. And then they trade and it goes up. You see that and you go, hmm, Offer fell away a little bit. Now they're buying it. It's upticking. And you can see that even though there's more depth on the offer than depth on the bid, sellers aren't using sell orders to hit to the bid. Buyers are actually having to buy into 59 in order to get their fills now. And then they lift again. And then it trades back and forth a little bit. But the point being, there will be situations where you will see depth fall away dramatically. And you'll clearly see when the buy side has control or the sell side has control. And that's what I'm showing you in this. There will be situations where, for example, actually, um, you may see 1,200 on the bid here 
and the market begins selling down towards it and that 1200 actually drops away to 400 and immediately the depth builds up on the offer and sellers begin to hit the bid there at five and that may clue you into the fact that there's not as much on the buy side as there appeared to be and therefore the market may move lower a few ticks as a result of that you know sell side pressure might continue now there are obviously more factors that play into deciding whether or not you want to execute a trade hold on to a trade etc but this is really really useful information that a day trader should absolutely be watching there's just a lot of times when it clues you in to at least you know the next few ticks um, and then you can determine how to manage it from there um, and of course I have more material that goes on into more depth about this but <clears throat> the, the point of this video is to just explain what exactly it is you're seeing and how it all fits together and again just to kind of show you an idea of the advantage you obviously see that the market is currently trading 21 you know 58 and you can see what's happened here and you can see over here but so far in this video you haven't seen what's happened in the interim so what I'm going to do here is something that most technical analysis courses do not do which is I'm going to cover the chart so you can't see how it played out and then ask okay well what do you do here if you're just looking at price and a chart uh, and some indicators let's say and even for that matter market profile because market profile is obviously useful at times to, to tell you about high volume and low volume areas but you can get beyond that and fine-tune entries and exits even more by watching bids and asks and prints okay and that's what I'm talking about here if the markets coming down like this and I've seen that there's been buy side support all morning in this area it would certainly make sense that this could hold as a support level right and it might make for a buy side trade um, however being an order flow trader I want to watch what the action looks like as it's approaching this level okay and it goes back to what I was just explaining if I can see that the sell side depth is heavier if I can see that they're slamming bids and not a lot it's coming back into the sell side and it looks like sellers are going for those prices and they're getting there very easily then I'm not going to be looking to play a buy side trade there I'm going to be looking to play a sell side trade as the market moves through now if it gets down to this level and I see something more like this where it gets down to the level and it stalls a bit and buyers seem to be willing to buy at the price and above those prices in that situation I would look to be more on the buy side and say okay it looks like the supports holding here you know maybe I'll take a buy side trade and have the market move up or it's also possible that the market can be really choppy in that area and I won't do anything at all you know it just depends but it, this isn't about an every time situation that's what newer traders have to understand you can't always know where the market's going to go you have to wait for your spots and you have to wait for clues that tip you off to future direction okay and that's not going to happen every minute of every day but this is an example of how those situations can arise okay so the market gets down there and I make a decision based on the order flow whereas a technical type trader often makes a call one way or the other and then they put in a stop loss which is often just random it's not really a good place to be a stop loss so a person might put in an order to buy uh, at this price and then they put in a sell stop six seven ticks away okay well they've clearly broken lows I don't want to be long anymore I need to be out but I want to give it some room that's always the, the thought or a seller maybe takes a sell side trade and then the market stalls out but they put in their cover up above this somewhere well okay I guess if it comes all the way up here it's not going to break lows and I don't want to be in anymore and they're not managing it as efficiently as they could be managing it you know so in other words I may take a buy side trade at six but let's say things shift and now suddenly the market goes from looking like this looking like this when I see 
the depth disappear on the buy side, <clears throat> excuse me, when I see the depth disappear on the buy side, and I see sellers begin to go for those buy orders, if I'm long at six, I don't need to watch the, the market drop to three or two or one. I just go ahead and bail out at five. I take the one tick loss and I go on about my business. Maybe I even reverse and turn around and sell fives looking for the market to go to three and get my money back plus some. It is possible to be chopped up in an area like that. Again, there are other factors that come into play here, but if you spend time watching the order book, you can begin to see what I'm describing uh, in this video. Now you'll see what took place here as I slide this over is a big sell-off. Uh, the market ended up rapidly deteriorating and um, dropping like a rock, essentially. It gets a quick snap bounce, that's to be expected. That is predominantly the result of people who are short up here covering their trades when it finally stops and bounces. Uh, then you get some more selling. And once again, as a technical trader, most of what you're seeing here would point towards the downside. Big bar down, green bar up, another red bar down. And so a lot of technical guys are trying to stay with the trend and stay on the downside. Now every trader would give you a different reason for doing what he or she does. And I understand that there would be some technical traders that would say, no, that's the extension and it's, you know, um, whatever, 50% retracement and the Fibonacci extension and all that. And so therefore I would be buying here. Um, but they're not basing their decisions on what they can see in the supply and the demand in the book. Um, and most aren't even basing their decisions on cumulative volume profile or market profile. You know, they're just kind of picking numbers. Um, and so if we slide over a little bit farther, we see this is what happened. At the point where it looks like sellers have major control and there's a strong trend down, that's actually where the market bounces, chops around, bounces again, comes back up, and begins to go sideways uh, for a while. And there can be multiple scalps within this area, depending on how the order flow goes. And I think that's another advantage order flow traders have, is they can often find areas where they might be able to risk two or three to make three or four, risk two or three to make three or four, and they can do it multiple times in some of this movement like this, whereas technical traders are usually either long here, blowing out, maybe going short somewhere in here and, you know, covering at some point, or they're short up here and it bounces around and they don't know what to do, and then it goes and it bounces, and then eventually they cover their short trade, and they make one trade in there and make some points, whereas the order flow scalper might make five or six trades um, and get three or four, three or four, three or four, three or four, and actually end up making two to three to four times as much as the technical trader who only makes one trade in that mess, okay? And again, this all depends on multiple factors, but it's just another example of some of the advantages to watching the order book. And then ultimately, the day panned out as so. The market does eventually turn around, comes all the way back in to this area, even pops all the way back up above the break point, um, the down break point, and then slowly falls back in. And, uh, you know, we're finished up over here whenever I was doing the recording. And like I said, there can be multiple plays here for scalpers watching the book, whereas often your technical traders don't really know what to do. Um, in areas like this because they're late to the game when the market begins running like that. A scalper is trying to jump on board quickly and take a few ticks. The, the technical trader is often maybe getting a buy side trade off in the middle and but then puts in a trailing stop and then the market comes back and then it doesn't really know how to manage it. So things like that can take place uh, even to the extent of being able to sometimes buy and sell and sell and buy and buy and sell, sell and buy. Um, so yes, it's easier said than done, but the opportunities are greater uh, for intraday scalpers than I think they are for most uh, technical indicator type traders. Another advantage to trading off the ladders and being an order flow trader is that with some practice, you can begin to watch multiple ladders side by side. This is a screenshot of my normal layout 
what I have up is the 10 year, the 30 year, the 5 year, the Ultra Bond, and the E Mini S and P 500. Uh, sometimes I also trade Eurex products. And so I have all of these ladders side by side, and I learned how to scan multiple ladders back when I was first trading. You can do it with practice. It can absolutely be done. A lot of people first come to me and they say, I don't have any idea how you can watch two ladders, let alone five ladders. And I say, it just takes some practice. And then within you know, a month or two, they say, oh yeah, I can do it too. Um, it's not as hard as I thought it was. It's like anything else. You just You have to do it for a while and then it begins to make sense. Why would you want to watch multiple ladders? Well, for example, in the treasury markets, there's a lot of interplay between these four markets. And sometimes you will see something in one market that you won't see in the others, and that's what tips you off to the next move. So the markets might be moving around, and I may see some action in the 10-year that makes me think, hey, that these markets are probably going up, and then I make the trade. Or I may see some action in the five year that makes me think, hey, I think the markets are going down, and then I make the trade. And so it's an advantage, um, actually, an advantage that you get mostly in treasuries. You, you don't see it as frequently in the equity indexes if you're watching the SP, the NASDAQ, and the Russell, for example. <clears throat> there can be some correlation there, but you see it more often in treasury markets. And so it's just one more edge, one more advantage that you can gain by watching the ladders. You know, so eventually you can watch multiple ladders. Now here you can see the ladders going up and down and you can see trades and you can see prints. Try to imagine if instead you're looking at the charts. So now I'm sitting here and I'm watching a chart of the 10 year, a chart of the 30, a chart of the five, a chart of the S&P and I'm trying to follow what's going on with these lines and it's not that you can't see which way they're going but it's not really giving you inf any information so for example the 10 year might be up at highs and you can see it's trading four four half let's say four and four half but I can't see how it's really taking place across all three markets um, where if I'm watching the depth of the depth and sales I can maybe see that all three markets are easily moving through offers and going for highs, or maybe the 30 year and the five year are not going for highs. In fact, they're going lower um, and sellers are going for bids. And so this can all have an effect on whether I do or do not make a trade and how I manage the trade. Uh, you'll see also Eurex the same way. I have the Bund, the Bobble, the Euro stocks, and the DAX all side by side and it's much easier to watch these four ladders than it would be to watch charts of all these products. The last thing I want to discuss in this video is giving up the bid ask spread unnecessarily and the impact that can have on your bottom line over the course of a year. A lot of traders particularly on the retail side do not spend enough time studying the mathematics involved in trading. Now, what I mean by that is they look at the bigger picture, which is I want to put some money in an account and turn it into more money. Okay, obviously that's why they're trading, that's why everybody does this. But what they don't do is they don't really look at all the various factors which come into play and how sometimes something that seems to be a small detail can actually end up making a huge difference in the bottom line and this is where programmers and you know guys who study statistics and the clients and these guys who are doing these HFT programs or firms they look at this uh, in the mo most minute of ways you know and they completely understand and it's one thing that gives them an edge so I want to share this with you so that you understand the impact this can have now obviously costs play a role in your bottom line your platform costs your uh, 
computer costs, if you have a desk fee at a firm or you're renting an office, commissions are huge. That plays a big role. And these are all things I discuss in other videos and in my course material. But for a novice looking at trading and wondering, okay, again, what are some of the advantages to watching the order book? This is one of them. Giving up the bid-ask spread for no reason. What do I mean by that? I mean, there are times when it's very clear that, let's say, if you want to sell, you can sell at 58.50 instead of 58.25. And this is a good example of this. We're not going to go into the why of you know, the, the action. I'm not going to say why I'm deciding to sell at 58.50 or, or buy at 58.50. This is just to explain to you, once the decision's been made, if I want to get short or I want to exit a long trade, however the case, whatever the case may be, if I'm watching the order book, for example, right here I can see there's 744 bid by 133 offer and buyers are using market orders to actively hit the offer. There's no reason for me to click into 5825 and use a market sell order to exit at 5825 when I can obviously place an order at 5850 and get filled. Right there it goes up. Okay, now whether or not I place the order or I change my mind or whatever, you know, you can debate that for different reasons. But the point is, <clears throat> there was no reason whatsoever to hit 5825s at that moment. It, it seemed very clear that I could hit, I would be able to get 5850s. And what does that do? It gets me another $12.50 in that trade. Um, whether it be a profit or I lose 12.50 less, or you know I'm able to uh, scratch instead of lose, whatever the case may be, I gain one more tick by looking at the bid and ask. I don't think novice traders understand how frequently that happens. It happens multiple times over the course of a day. And what I mean by that is there are plenty of times throughout the day when you can clearly see that a price is about to go bid or go offer. And if you're contemplating buying or selling, you can work the limit order and get the fill one tick better than you would if you did a market order. Now there are times when you don't want to do that. There are times when it's unclear where both sides are about equal and the market's trading back and forth. Okay, and to look at our, our diagrams again, for example, this would be an area where if I want to buy five for whatever reason, I'm pretty sure I can work a bid at five and I can get that extra tick. I don't need to, to pay up the six. There's more size on the offer. The sellers are winning the battle. They're already hitting the bid. I can get the extra tick, right? However, in this scenario, I can see that, you know what? I probably can't get five and I don't want to pay up the seven. So realistically, the market's going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. I probably should go ahead and pay up to six. I'll use a market order. Maybe it will get to five, maybe it won't. Um, but if I want to be in the trade and I don't want to miss the trade, I probably need to pay up. You know what I mean? Um, or if I'm exiting a trade and let's say I'm short and the market's been going down, I, you know, I don't really want to watch it bounce back to seven or eight. I think I'll go ahead and take the profit at six. All right, so this is again an advantage of watching the order book. So sometimes when I'm reading the description, of features for a platform, I read uh, one click trading from the chart. So you can place orders directly from your chart, adjust them from your chart. And when I read that, it makes me cringe because all I can think about is, man, how many times are people giving up the bid and the ask when they do that for no reason whatsoever? They're doing it because they're not looking at the mathematics. And of course, they also don't have an understanding of the order book. So let me break down the mathematics on this for you and that hopefully it influences you enough that if you decide to start trading, you you know, you know take a look at uh, a market depth platform whenever you're executing orders. So let me break this down for you. And I realize this may seem simplistic to some people, but there are literally thousands of people in the world who don't understand this when they start trading. And it's important uh, to know this. 
So let's break this down in the S&P. One tick in the ES is $12.50. A chart trader places a market order instead of a limit order because he's not watching the order book. This is what we just discussed. As a result of this, he unnecessarily gives away $12.50. So in that scenario, rather than waiting for $58.50, where clearly he could have sold, he uses a market order to sell at 58.25 because he wants to be out. Okay, and he gives up that tick for no reason. Let's say he does this once a day. 12.50 a day times five days a week, 62.50 a week. 62.50 a week times four weeks a month is 2.50 a month. And then let's not even say 12 months a year, let's just say 10 months a year. 2.50 a month times 10 months a year is 2,500 a year. Giving up the bid ask spread once a day when it's not necessary, uh, because in other words, it's not necessary because if he was watching the order book, he would have known better. It cost him 2,500 per contract over the course of the year. And I reemphasize per contract. So a 10 lot trader who makes this error in judgment once a day costs himself 25,000 a year. That is huge. It's massive yet people don't break it down to this degree and a lot of people will say well I'm not going to do that once a day even if you only give up the bid ask unnecessarily twice a week okay twice a week would be $25 a week 100 bucks a month a thousand a year a thousand a year per contract because you're not watching the order book and getting slightly better fills when you could it makes a big difference. Does it mean you always have to go for the bid or the ask? No, of course not. And that's what I discussed at the beginning of this section. There are going to be times when it's not that clear, you know, and you do need to pay up or pay down uh, because you may miss the trade or you may end up chasing if you're in a losing trade. You don't want to chase if you're in a losing trade. But once or twice, three times a week, there's going to be trades you can make where you look at it and you go, yeah, I can get the bid here. And you get the bid instead of paying up at the offer, and it saves you that tick. And over the course of the year, it can save you thousands of dollars, if not tens of thousands, depending on how much size you trade. And so this is where I was going with this. You know, most traders are only thinking about making winning trades and making a profit. They want to turn $10,000 into $20,000, but they are not contemplating all of the mathematics involved. So guys open an account, they want to put 10 grand in. If they make 10 grand and they turn it into 20 they think that's awesome I'm great I'm spectacular I'm making money but if they would spend more time studying the mathematics and fine-tuning entries and exits so they could save a tick here and there they could often substantially increase their bottom lines instead of turning 10,000 into 20,000 they may turn 10,000 into 25,000 or 23,000 or 27,000 the point is by studying the mathematics involved and learning little tricks like knowing when you can and cannot give up the bid ask you can substantially increase your bottom line because those ticks add up over the course of a year in a big way all right so that's just one more thing to contemplate and one more reason uh, day traders should be watching the order book and that brings us to the end of this video I hope you found it helpful if you have questions, please feel free to email me. Uh, go to my site, nobsdaytrading.com. I have a contact page. You can send me an email. I have lots of free information on my site. I have some videos on my site and on my YouTube page where you can watch uh, live trades so you can see how these ideas come to life in real time. And that's it. So thanks for watching.